Well, good evening or good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to start in just a few minutes. We're going to give this a little bit of time, let a few more folks come in. Okay. Well, um, welcome uh, this evening. My name is Dan Misla. I'm the founder and executive director of Catholic Climate Covenant, and I'm very thrilled uh, for this webinar tonight because it's meant a lot to me. Um, this is, uh, hopefully you have watched the film uh, that was on PBS, uh, and if you hadn't and you still would like to see it, it is available on PBS Passport, and we Strongly encourage you to watch it. It's it's a it's a wonderful film about the famous Jesuit uh, Father Pierre uh, Teilhard de Chardin. So we we strongly encourage you to watch that. Um, as I said, my name is Dan Misla. Um, I first learned of uh, Father Pierre back in undergraduate school many many decades ago. Uh, it was a class that actually changed my life, partially because of the teaching of. Uh, uh, Deschardins, uh, Father Teilhard, uh, but also because it was a class in Catholic social teaching and sent me on my trajectory to work in the church for justice and peace. Um, so I have a ways to go, but here we are. Uh, tonight, we're going to dive a little deeper into this extraordinary scientist and theologian and try to discover what his teaching might mean for us today in a climate-threatened world. So before we begin, a um, couple of housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and a link will be made available to all the registrants uh, and it'll be sent to you within 24 to 48 hours. So look for that in your email. Please submit your questions to Sister Kathy, who I'll introduce in a minute, in the Q&A box. We won't be looking for questions in the chat function. That's really for you to communicate with one another. Um, those who are attending the session, the chat should should not be used, as I said, to submit questions. And please remember to be civil and kind in the chat. Um, that's an important quality for all of us. So before we begin, let me um, offer this prayer. This is Teilhard's prayer of the universe. So let's quiet ourselves, be in God's presence, be grateful for this day and for one another and for this opportunity to spend the next hour together. Okay, I added that to the list. I bless you, matter, and you I acclaim, not as the pontiffs of science or the moralizing preachers depict you, debased, defigured, a mass of brute forces and base appetites, but as you reveal yourself to me today, in your totality, and your true nature. I acclaim you as the divine milieu charged with creative power, as the ocean stirred by the spirit, as the clay molded and infused with life by the incarnate word. Raise me up then, matter, to those heights, through struggle and separation and death. Raise me up until... At long last, it becomes possible for me in perfect chastity to embrace the universe. Amen. Amen. Well, again, we are thrilled to introduce Sister Kathleen Duffy, a sister of St. Joseph. She's Professor Emerita of Physics and Director of the Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill College in Pennsylvania. She is president of the American Teilhard Association, associate editor, editor of Teilhard Studies, a biannual publication of the American Teilhard Association, and serves on the board of Cosmos and Creation. Her current research interest concerns the religious essays of the Jesuit paleontologist and the relationship of his synthesis to modern developments in science. She has published Teilhard's Mysticism, 
seeking the interface of evolution, Teilhard's struggle, embracing the work of evolution, and edited a volume of essays about Teilhard's life and work entitled Rediscovering Teilhard's Fire, as well as numerous book chapters and articles about Teilhard. Sister Kathleen also guides evening, weekend, and week-long retreats on topics related to Teilhard's life and work. So I am going to turn it over to Sister Kathy, and we welcome you, and we look forward to your presentation. Afterwards, we'll have some time for questions, and, uh, and hopefully we'll all come away much, much more enriched. So Sister Kathy, take it away. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction and for inviting me to reflect with your members on how Teilhard might help us to navigate the present climate crisis. And welcome to our guests. I understand that many of you have watched the Frost film, Teilhard, Visionary Scientist. Oh, I forgot to share my screen, I'm sorry. Let me do that. There we go. There we go. So this, this is the name of the film, Teilhard, Visionary Scientist, which you probably know by now. Uh, and um, it, it, it's such a moving uh, storyline, I think you've, you've probably noticed. Uh, Teilhard's is such an amazing life. And uh, the film sh it is, uh, it showcases a diversity of settings, all the scenes from which uh, from the many places where Teilhard lived and worked, as well as a story that's beautifully told. I don't know whether you realize it, but it took Frank and Mary Frost 13 years to complete the film. So I don't know if Frank and Mary are here with us. I thought maybe they would be, but... They are. Um, they are. Oh, I am going to go ahead and promote uh, Frank and see if he will show up. Okay. And then I think we should give a rousing cheer to the two of them for the work, the amazing amount of work that they were able to accomplish during that amount of time. Okay, he has had to step out, but he's rejoining okay. as a panelist in a minute. Okay, good. okay, shall we wait for him to speak or just go on? Go ahead and then when he comes okay, in. And maybe you can interrupt, okay. Yeah. If you haven't had time to view the film yet, you really should. During the next two years, it, you can, you're able to watch free on your computer or tablet by going to the American Teilhard Association's website. That's right there on the screen. If you go there, all you have to do is press the, the top image and you're in. It's very easy. So um, now, although I Mr. Kathy, he's here. So good. So let's give Frank and Mary a rousing hand of applause for the wonderful work they've done with the, um, with the, um, with the film. And Frank or Mary, do you want to say a word or two to the audience? I just want to say that we are very honored that you're doing this uh, using a, a film as part of the uh, discussion. But we didn't come here to be applauded. We came here to listen uh, <laughs> because we have a lot to learn about. Uh, how Teilhard connects to the environmental crisis. So we're here to learn. We love you and thank you for your your applause, Albert. <laughs> Thanks. We're, we're humbled that you joined us. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks so much. And so I'm not really going to discuss the content of the film directly, mm -hmm. but the storyline is going to really uh, provide a context for what I have to say. The film provides um, portrays Teilhard as a young boy, as a serious seminarian, as a compassionate soldier, as a professional paleontologist, and as a dedicated priest. And in each case, as a human being who was truly in love with matter in all its forms and in all the stages of his life. 
He's in love with rocks and flowers, with sky and sea, with friends and relatives, and with all Earth's creatures. His choice of a career in paleontology and geology provided him with a particularly intimate way of touching Earth. However, if you leaf through all 13 volumes of his religious work, you will encounter not even one mention of the climate crisis. Instead, you'll find phrases such as communion with God through Earth, the spirit of Earth, the soul of the world, phrases that express what seem at first unusual interconnections. Even in 1955, the year when Taylor died, awareness of a climate crisis was not apparent to most as it is now. I remember first hearing concern in the 1970s while attending a graduate seminar in the Atmospheric Sciences Department, but certainly not while watching the nightly news. It has taken us a long time to understand what has been happening and an even longer time to figure out what to do about it, and perhaps an even longer time to find the courage and the generosity to respond. So if Taylor didn't speak directly to the, um, the um, climate crisis and wasn't yet aware of the amount of damage we would cause in such a short time, what can he possibly say to us today? My aim this evening is to show you that Teilhard has a message of hope, one that can provide humanity with the energy needed to respond to the climate crisis, as well as the many other crises that plague our world. In his major opus, The Human Phenomenon, Teilhard tells us that if we want humanity to flourish, what we must do as a human species is to see to see what is happening in the cosmos and on planet Earth. To see how we have evolved to where we are now and where we might be going in the future. And always to see more and to see better. But for Teilhard, a complete act of seeing requires seeing not only matter's material face, but what he, what he also calls matter's inner face, its spiritual side. He wants us to gaze at matter, at rocks and plants, at the many species of animals, including ourselves, so we can begin to experience and reverence matter's sacred character. By the way, you see here that I spell matter with a capital M, because I want to emphasize that, that like that, like Teilhard, all matter, both non-living and living, and not simply human, has an inner life, a spiritual component, something like the two sides of a coin. Now, although Teilhard has been, had been gazing at the beauty of Earth from the ver his very early childhood days, it was actually while in the seminary that he stumbled on a theory that would spark his greatest insight the theory of evolution. For Teilhard, evolution was life-changing. It was dramatic. It helped him to understand how things came to be and where the cosmos might be heading. Unlike the Genesis stories of the scripture that present a static model of creation, the evolutionary story focuses on the step-by-step -step emergence of new forms and new species over the past 13.8 billion years. Teilhard began to visualize non-living things, such as elements, the galaxies and the stars, and living things such as planets and animals, as they were emerging since the beginning of time and into the future. Contemplating the universal becoming, he noted how the cosmos seems to be being drawn forward, a lord ahead toward a future of ever greater complexity and consciousness. 
Each element is yearning to become more, to increase its potential, its beauty, its consciousness. Each element becomes a co-creator as it responds to the impulse ingrained in all of matter to become more. Teilhard came to discover a mechanism by which this happens and called it creative union. Creative union is a process where, by which new and more complex forms of matter come about. He defines creative union in the following way. Whenever two or more entities seize their sense of individualism, but not their identity, and unite, they are capable of more, of becoming something new. From the very beginning of time, this is the way creation has progressed. New entities come to be from the union of simpler entities. Nuclei join with electrons to form atoms, which come together to form molecules that eventually form cells, which then become part of organisms that make up living things. Each union produces something new and more complex than the elements of which it is made. Creative union is a process that seems programmed into the cosmic becoming. Signs of the existence of creative union are apparent in our yearning for relationship, for life, and for the more. Teilhard also noted that elements formed by creative union are capable of a level of consciousness greater than that of their individual components. A committee is a good example of the phenomenon that Teilhard calls the law of complexity consciousness. As Teilhard continued to grasp patterns in the universal becoming, he experienced a second startling and profound insight, one that gave him confidence in humanity's ability to survive and to flourish. He became aware of the massive amount of knowledge, both academic and practical, intellectual and spiritual, that throughout the ages has accumulated and been stored in a kind of global brain. A network of spirit, a web of connection that surrounds planet Earth. He calls this web the noosphere. The noosphere is a powerful treasure that continues to be developed and shared. Its existence gave Teilhard confidence that the cosmos is going somewhere. He could see that despite multiple setbacks, humanity is moving forward to greater consciousness. The new sphere has a direction, one that we are called to follow without turning back. And we are responsible for this forward movement with the rest of earth creatures. To slip back, to live and act in a way that we become less conscious of our world and its needs would be to violate the sacred mandate. Rather, we are called to live sustainably with matter, to de dedicate ourselves to Earth's flourishing in whatever way we can. But like many choices for the good, this kind of dedication is sometimes difficult to sustain and perhaps even might lead us into danger. However, you, we humans are creative, able to adapt, to focus on the good of the whole and to dedicate ourselves to a cause greater than ourselves. These are gifts that are terribly needed for the forward movement. While Teilhard was being dazzled by the theory of evolution and searching to understand the cause of its, this allure, he was also reading the Gospel of John and the letters of, um, of Paul. John tells us that in the beginning, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Thus Christ, the word, has been present in the cosmos from the beginning and has been encouraging the cosmos to become something more ever since. Paul in his epistles tells us that it is Christ who holds all matter together. 
and that in the resurrection of Jesus, Christ has gone ahead to allure us into the future, drawing us into union, into the omega of evolution, where we will finally become one in Christ. Looking at incarnation through the lenses of scripture and evolution, Teilhard became aware of evolution's creative potential and vowed to help his church see whatever he was seeing, that evolution and incarnation are two sides of a single process. Yet it took him a lifetime. And as you know from the film, his attempt to articulate this view provoked much resistance from the church and the Jesuit order that he loved so deeply. In fact, his views were so challenging that Teilhard was forbidden to preach or publish anything about them during his lifetime. It was only after his death that his 13 volumes of religious essays began to seep out into the public, thanks to the wise counsel from his superior that he will his writings to, oops, I think I went too far that he wills his writings to Jean Mortier so they could be published after his death. In his major opus, The Human Phenomenon, Teilhard sets out the steps in the evolutionary process. Many of you know the work of Thomas Barry and Brian Swim, who have taken Teilhard's timeline, updated his science, and de developed a lovely step-by-step -step story of how the universe as we know came to be. But what is either often neglected or at least downplayed by those who tell the universe story is the aspect from which Teilhard derived his greatest comfort and his greatest hope. The fact that Christ is not only present within all of the cosmos, but also up ahead luring the cosmos into ever greater union. Teilhard could sense Christ in matter, he described his experience in his treatise, The Divine Milieu. Spending time in the divine milieu relating to earth as sacred helped him to commune with God at its heart. The divine milieu motivated him to continue on with his God-given call, despite the resistance he was meeting. He experienced its spiritual power a power that is often unlocked whenever we are in relationships. From the time he served as a stretcher bearer during World War I, Teilhard became more and more concerned about the state of the world. He had expected the horrors of trench warfare to surely encourage world leaders to find new ways to work for peace. And although establishing the League of Nations seemed a good idea at the time, the world soon, too soon, became engaged in World War II. Teilhard found the myriads of crises that affect his world seem to have common roots and perhaps common ways forward. He became convinced that his synthesis would provide a more relevant approach and spent his latter days working out the details. If lived to the full, these principles should help us to move forward. And so I list a few of these. Um, and, and the first of these I would say is that all matter is infused with divine presence and is sacred. So that to violate earth in any way is to violate the sacred and implies that we are acting at a lower level of consciousness. And again, each element of the cosmos is responsible in, to some degree to move the cosmos forward. We humans are co-creators of the next stage of evolution. Embedded within the new sphere, we are charged to do what we can as a human community to slip back from the, for, uh, to slip back from the forward movement or um, of, of evolution into a state that is less complex and less conscious would be to be irresponsible. A third principle is that chaos is often necessary, a necessary step in transformation processes. 
It's a normal occurrence in the universe story. Rather than an obstacle to process, progress, chaos often becomes the driving force for transformation. The chaos of today's world seems to be driving us to final, finally face up to the problem. And finally, change takes time. We know that it has taken 13.8 billion years for us to come onto Earth, and so patience is necessary. One of the major problems that keeps us from responding wholeheartedly to these principles and to the present um, a climate crisis is our prevailing worldview. We're so embedded and trapped that we fail to see the damage it does to the good of the whole. Here are some of the values that impede us. Our demand for comfort, ease, efficiency. They keep us from responding to the cry of earth for change. And then we have our individualism, anthropocentrism, consumerism, which keep us selfish and self-focused and impede our progress. We resist change and new ideas. Things are, innovations are too expensive, too inconvenient, too hard to implement. And so we're unwilling to explore new ideas and instead resist change. And another thing is when we look at the large problems, we feel powerless. And so rather than joining with others, we, we um, minimize our potential for good. <clears throat> Taylor would suggest our cultivating the following values instead. First would be, of course, respecting the sacred nature of matter. Without that, I don't know how we can really move ahead. And then valuing relationship, communion, interdependence. So our relationship with earth, with one another, with God, our communion with one another, the interdependence that, that will help us to move ahead. And finally, practicing creative union. This isn't finally, this is um, one of the next ones. By joining and participating in groups such as the Catholic Climate Covenant and working together with others to discern solutions and commit to, to, ta to tasks, no matter how small, and with our, all our heart and minds put together. I think that is the key that if we put our hearts and minds together, um, we can do anything. Um, and learning how to grow in greater consciousness. This is not easy, this takes work. And so um, that's another step in the process. It's important to look with hope and future into the, pro into the future. If we lose hope, if we don't try to build uh, and, and what we dream, then it will never happen. And so these are some of the values that would be um, helpful to, um, to implement as we move into the future. But the question is, where do we find the energy and the motivation? I think this is the biggest question, the motivation. Um, first of all, we need to believe that we do have the know-how um, we, it's been, you know, as, as, as I was saying about the news fair, it's been accumulated through the years. We, we know a lot, we can do a lot. And if we put our minds down to it, we can, um, you know, accomplish a lot. Also, we must work together with others. We don't need to act alone. In fact, the only human embrace, this is what Teilhard says, capable of worthily enfolding the divine is that of all of humanity opening its arms to call down and welcome the fire. And finally, we must dedicate ourselves to a project greater than ourselves with all, all our hearts and minds put together. This is the way we can find meaning in our lives and enough energy to continue. So without, without a sense of the divine presence within the cosmos, without a sense of the sacredness of all matter, it seems almost impossible to me to imagine how to even begin to motivate the kind of leap in consciousness that will make a difference in the life of our planet. 
Teilhard's ability to see Christ in the divine milieu took time to gaze at the, um, he, pardon me, allured him into the future. He lived in the divine milieu, took time to gaze at the cosmos as sacred, to experience the inspiration and guidance of the living, breathing presence of the divine at the heart of matter. He sensed the cosmic Christ, whom he called Omega, constantly luring him from the future, providing him with the inspiration and wisdom he needed to sustain his journey. Shortly before he died, Teilhard developed one of his most powerful images of God and God's action in the world and called it the Christic. He imaged the cosmos, which he represents by a complexifying cone contained within a Christosphere, a sphere in which Christ Omega is continually radiating the energy of love and alluring, an alluring matter to move forward. Our role is to absorb that energy and re-radiate it, to channel the love throughout the sphere until finally the cosmos will catch fire and burst into flame. Then we will know that the heart of matter is a world heart, the heart of God. In conclusion, I want to stress that we must keep hope alive, not a naive optimism that refuses to look at stark realities, but a hope built on our uh, experience of earth, of humanity, of, and of God. The future is not determined. It is up to us to move the cosmos forward. We must expect a better future, not a future of ease, but a future where all might flourish. We must build what we desire. We must persevere in hope and expectation. As Teilhard said, the flame must be revived at all costs. At all costs, we must renew in ourselves the desire and hope for the great coming. And we must believe, and the more threatening and irreducible reality appears, the more firmly and desperately must we believe. But most of all, we must love. We must love earth enough to give our all for her sake. And if we do, the day will come when after harnessing the winds, the tides, gravitation, we shall harness for God the energies of love. And on that day, for the second time in the history of the world, we will have discovered fire. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Kathleen. That was, uh, that was wonderful. Um, lots, lots to chew on. Um, when we were discussing how this would, how we would handle the Q and A, I was, um, going to ask a couple of questions myself, but I realized that because Catholic climate covenant attracts the best and the brightest, I thought I would answer, uh, ask some questions from our audience because they really are profound questions. Uh, some of them came in even before we started the webinar tonight. So let me ask this, um, this first question from Jean. Um, and she asked, what is Teilhard's understanding of evil in an evolutionary world? She continues, my question emerges within the context of our times when evil seems to be taking many forms. How would he understand the war in Gaza, in the Ukraine, facing climate crisis, and with it the displacement of people, famine, etc., in light of evolution as well as conspiracy theories which lies and entangles realities and are further replicated by technology? So heavy-duty question there. Um, what would you say, how would, how would Teilhard handle kind of this chaos that we feel like we're in today? Yes, it's a, it's a, a, a very disturbing thought, right? That we are surrounded by it right now uh, in ways that we probably haven't been. But of course, in an evolutionary process, we would expect more complicated problems to emerge as we become more conscious and more capable of uh, different things. Certainly, uh, Teilhard, knew about evil and thought about evil. Um, I, but I think that the key is that we have a choice. We have free will. 
And so some, you know, some are going to choose good and some will not. And some choose some terrible things because of things that have been done to them. I was thinking that of some of the younger people who have done some so ter such terrible things. You know, some of the, um, the massacres, you know, that have happened. And it's it's because they have been mistreated. But, um, but I think uh, the best way to think about evil and any kind of destruction that happens in the evolutionary process, it's, it's usually, it's often a creative, it, it has a creative potential. For instance, um, you know, I, I think of a volcano, for instance, uh, you know, often the, the, uh, the, um, the lava spews out and um, onto the grounds below. And unfortunately, the poor are usually seated, you know, a, a living right there, and they there was a lot of damage to them. But years later, the uh, soil is very fertile. Now, what's the problem? Well, why are those people housed there when they could be somewhere else? So in other words, the choices that we make causes creative, um, you know, the creative process sometimes to um, to become you know un un un, un you know and not good for us, but anyway, I think um, I think today, I mean, when I think about the 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 upsurge of all of these things, you know, especially the climate crisis, um, but also the wars, um, it's it's a, a call to us, and I think Teilhard believed that you, humanity is good, humans are good, people are good, and that they will eventually see that they need to act in a different way. Like for instance, after World War One, there was a change. You know, after World War Two, there was the United Nations. There, we keep coming up with other ideas about how to deal with this. And I think that's the, um, you know, the, the store of the new sphere. There are, there's a lot of creativity there. And the more we act together for good, the better, you know, things will be. So that's a big question. I don't know if that helps, Jean, but, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't be discouraged. I think we have to keep, I think we have to keep hope and realize that if we can work together as so many people are, I'm just so, um, you know, happy, uh, you know, with so many of the organizations that are arising that seem to be moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, there's, there's a bunch of questions. I'm going to try to get to as many as I can. Um, we're not going to get to them all. If you do have a question, just re remember to post that in the, um, in the Q and A box, um, I see others have raised their hands. We we can't we can't get you onto the webinar to ask your question, so you have to type it into the Q and A box. Um, so this is from Gina. Um, what what might Teilhard mean when he says we need a new God? Who or what is that God? Well, I think I tried to give you, to give you a little light on to what Teilhard thought about it. Um, he certainly, uh, he felt that, that, uh, well, first of all, so many people are still thinking of God with beard up in heaven, you know, counting all our sins and things like that. That is not helping us. Um, and, uh, I think the sad part is that the church hasn't, you know, really done much to, uh, allow theologians and to promote good theology uh, you see it in certain um, places, you know, these groups that are Catholic groups that are coming up that are working for good, the Jesuits doing the, um, working on the, um, the, the goals of Laudato Si. Many of the sisters congregations for years have been working on the universe story, trying to get us, you know, it, um, interested in, you know, goodness with earth. So, so these kinds of things are happening, I think, to help, but, um, but our images of God are still pretty poor, I think. And um, I, I love that, Christic, I don't know whether that was clear enough, but the idea that here we are all together and, you know, Christ is radiating, so Christ is energy radiating to us, you know, filling our 
spirits with energy and we are re-radiating to one another right here all with however many we are to this this evening and um i in this way if we can be more conscious of that i think and think of that as an image of god rather than the kinds of images we grew up with Thank God you. is a person, but a person is what? It's it's a, some it's an entity we can relate to. So Earth is a person too. So we need to, and and Earth is full of God. So this is this is a whole new way of thinking. I think and I feel and um, just hope that you know little by little we can um, we can um, make that clearer to people. What makes me. Um, what disturbs me in a way is that the church at one point in time would have had, would have been a great center um, to motivate because of it, it's universal. It's throughout the world. And yet because of, you know, the way um, people are often displeased with, you know, the way the church is or the images of God that they have, it's not able to do that anymore. So how can, you know, can the church or what can be the next way to move us ahead as one? And that's a good question for all of you. Right. There's a there's a bunch of questions that focus on uh, Teilhard's notion of matter and then matter and spirit. Um, I'm not quite sure which one to ask. So so let me. Let me try this one and see if this if this gets at uh, this question that a lot of people are having. Uh, was Teilhard aware of the developments of quantum physics because his religious language of spirit seems to be another description of this same same concept about matter? So, as a physicist, I'm hoping that you that's a softball question for you. Yeah, I um, he, I don't think he he well he certainly didn't know anything about quantum physics. I mean yeah. he certainly didn't solve the Schrodinger equation, <laughs> as did most people who talk about it. Um, but um, but there is there are some concepts in um, in quantum physics that are more both and rather than either or, and I think those are the ones that make one wonder, you know, was it in the air? You know, was this new way of seeing things in the air and whether you knew quantum physics or not, you were kind of picking it up. It's like the next level of consciousness. So to, to uh, they define uh, the next level as being able to deal with paradox. You know, it's not either or, it's both and. Is there a way for us to see that? And that's the problem in the world today, right? We're either or, either you're this or you're, you're the Democrat or Republican, either you're Hamas or you're Israel, you're either you're, you know, I mean, there are all these polarities that um, keep us apart. And so quantum physics, you know, is is um, able to, you know, to deal with that in a different way. I mean, the ideas that emerge from the way, from the way the equations work out. And so, yes, there isn't, but he did, I don't think he knew anything about it himself. Thank you. Um, maybe another way to get at this, a question from Gary and Donna, if matter is sacred, why do we continue to exploit all matter of mother earth? Maybe our economic system needs to be questioned. Mm -hmm. So it's this, cons you know, I, we, we've heard about this, this idea that, you know, if we continue to consume matter mm -hmm. the earth's resources in the way that we uh, especially those of us in developed countries are doing so we're going to need an, at least another planet maybe two or three more planets to survive so maybe right. um how, how would you how would you address that well i think you answered the question <laughs> i mean i think whoever it was that asked it answered it it, it is the systems you know and the consumerism i mean we're always being bombarded you know, you watch television and there are 25 commercials. I said, oh, thank goodness I'm here for the commercials tonight. Do you know? I mean, and, and we're bombarded with new things to think, to buy. We're bombarded with things that fall apart easily so that we can buy more. And um, I, I don't know how that's going to change uh, unless we begin to see Earth as sacred. You know, I mean... That's that seems to me the key to me. Like if I 
I kind of feel like crying every time I see paper being not being recycled. I mean, it really bothers me. It really hurts me because I, I know something else should be happening here. And um, that's just one of the many, many things, you know. So, um, so I think unless we begin to internalize that and say, or I mean, he spent time contemplating matter, you know, contemplating the beauty of earth and being able to feel that sacred presence. I think if we don't do that, it's going to continue to be objective instead of subjective. We won't have the same. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, we can say oh, that, you know, the uh, corporations should do something, sure, but they're not going to do it unless we do, you know. So I think it, the, the, uh, the solutions come from many different uh, avenues, and we are. We need to be more conscious of what our role is or else who knows. Okay, I don't know if that helps. Yeah, thank you. Um, here's an interesting question from Richard. Uh, the film lifts up the importance of the feminine in sustaining Teilhard on his journey. How did Teilhard incorporate the feminine into his thought about the nature of Christogenesis? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, actually, what he, he wrote one essay. He wrote an essay called The Eternal Feminine, which, I, you know, feminists might not particularly like the title. But what he did, he went back to Proverbs 8. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's the story of creation from the viewpoint of Sophia, of Sophia wisdom. It's a gorgeous piece. And I've taken it and rewritten it, and, you know, put some, you know, updated science into it. And people love it. I mean, they begin to see how to relate to Sophia, who's, you know, still with us today, you know, prodding us on, you know, the kind of like a, I don't know what, um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that, that, I don't know what he was thinking when he wrote that essay, except that he knew in his own experience that the feminine was absolutely necessary. You know, he said that there was never um, something worthwhile that happened in his life that the feminine was not present. His mother, his um, cousin Marguerite, his, um, you know, so many other friends, uh, uh, even Jean Houston, if you saw the film, you know, even that in a relationship, you can see that there was something about the feminine that he knew was so important. And unfortunately, our church is still holding back and not, you know, taking advantage of the, of the uh, feminine, um, you know, of, uh, you know, of allowing women to have their rightful place in the church. And so uh, it really is important. What are some of, uh, beside yourself, <laughs> What are some of the names of today's scientists who are thinking along the same lines as Teilhard's evolutionary? Uh, I think that I think Judy meant to say newest sphere. Yeah. So who who are some of the who who are some of the other people we should be paying attention to thinking along these same lines? Oh. Yeah, I should have my list. Well, I certainly think of Sister Ilya Delio. Of course, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. and she's um, yeah, a scientist plus that. Uh, plus a theologian, uh, and that always helps. Um, I, I, think, um, I think of people often who are, um, who are theologians, but who have learned the science, like John Haught, well, Ilya too, she would be um, you know, somebody in that category too. It's more the theological, and then learning the science and incorporating that and some, um, and Phil Clayton is another person who's very active in uh, um, climate, you know, climate um, in, in, in the ecological movement. Um, uh, those are people that I'm thinking, but they're they're theologians, you know. Um, I, I, I'm just not. I mean, we have people all the time talking at our institute, and I just can't. yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and I certainly would, uh, you want to point out your website again, because there's a lot of resources. Yes, and I could point out that website, which if you want to know, that's where you should go. We have an Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill College. And the website is I R A N D S, uh, Reli Institute Religion and Science, I R A N D, no, I R A N D S dot org. And then the American Teilhard Association also has lots of, um, uh, you know, uh, videos and things like that that you then a lot of resources and that would be if you know how to spell Teilhard's name is just Teilhard de Chardin dot org great so look it up okay. yeah <laughs> okay so um, so you'll see a lot of resources there and also on Frank Foss uh what is that called um Teilhard Teilhard project the Teilhard project yes that's another place where you can find lots of resources especially in the future. Yeah. So uh, there's some, the chat now. some other suggestions in the, in the chat, Matthew Fox, not a scientist, but certainly no. a, a thinker, Richard Rohr, uh, Catherine Hayhoe, who is a scientist, but I'm not sure how engaged he is with Teilhard's thinking. Elizabeth mm -hmm. Johnson, when she wrote, ask the beast, Darwin and the God of love. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, yeah, so you're mix. naming theologians, yeah, yeah, a little mix Mostly. of theologians and scientists. Right. But yes, yeah. yeah, but yeah. Richard Bohr, I think, is is an interesting phenomenon. I think he's very good at helping people who are starting up, you know, and getting yeah. getting into it. He's he's down to earth and quotes the right people. Yeah, yeah, I love his. Um, the one thing that attracted me to Richard Bohr is his is his mirror medallion. You heard oh. of that? You know. You, he, he wears this the, a little mirror on his chest. Well, I don't know if he does it, but he he encourages people to do so. And it's a reflection of the world and how we are uh, made up of the same stuff as the rest of the world. Uh, yeah, and, that's you know, that, that whole concept, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Um, um, kind of some, some questions are a little bit more than questions. Let's see. Um, <laughs> Um, let's see, I think I remember Teilhard being influenced by some Native American cultures. My question is, why don't we just abandon this European lifestyle and tradition and turn to love of uh, Mother Nature by the way Native Americans do? So mm -hmm. uh, and there was some discussion in the chat about that earlier, too. I'm not sure that Teilhard was, you know, um, familiar with native americans yeah yeah really but i think the 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 um the, it's a good idea to to study their ways and and as somebody said not just co-op them you know yeah. like to try to find out you know from the you know the basis of that and what a, the different attitude is you know not just to act you know a, a play act what they're doing um because it's a very deep, and any culture, I mean, you can't pull it apart or take it on um, without destroying it. You know, there's something that we have to be very, um, I think, very, uh, again, very respectful of, you know. But there are a lot of good principles there. Yeah. That could be helpful. Yeah, I certainly think so as well. Um does Teilhard really think that at the final Omega moment, evil will no longer exist? What will no longer exist? <laughs> evil. Evil. I don't know whether he really thinks that. He does do. Um, he does do a piece in the Divine Milieu about hell, and in the end, after going back and forth and back and forth, he decides. It can't possibly. The people are too good for that. So um, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to know what is the afterlife. I mean, we're not going to come back looking like this, right? <laughs> yeah. We're not going to, you know, it's it's a whole different um, kind of, you know, it is a, a transformation into another way of being. And so um, I don't know. I, I don't know what um, what else he would say today. 
I mean, he was in the war. He saw that war and he was so discouraged by World War II. It's not as if he was, you know, um, naively optimistic. But um, but there was something about, you know, how he uh, really did love uh, people and saw their saw them as their best. They had very few people that he didn't do well with. There were a couple of superiors and Jesuits who <laughs> didn't treat him well. But other than that, I think most people that he interacted with, you know, he got along very well with and beautifully. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, well, there's so many questions here and um, trying to pull out some ones that um, Oh, well, this is an interesting one. You may you may or may not know the answer to this. I certainly don't. But are there people you know who are working on a curriculum for preschool and elementary levels that address the, uh, the Telhardian universe story? Um, Beth says, I'm aware of Jennifer Morgan's trilogy of right. children's mm -hmm. books. Are you aware of anything like um, that? Yes, Amy, her name's escaping me right now. But she has a whole organization that tries to work on some of these qualities anyway. You know, maybe not exactly um, the universe story, but um, values that are like this. Um, uh, I wish I could get that back. Um, in like high schools and in different schools. I mean, there are lots of uh, thousands of students that she's, you know, she's involved with. Um, not her particular, you know, exactly, but, you know, the people in her group. And it sounds like a wonderful, you know, a wonderful um, uh, uh, thing to do. I know we keep wondering how to do that. You know, we, we would love to, to do more uh, for young people because so many uh, uh, people who are interested in Teilhard, for instance, are older. And once we die off, you know, who's going to carry the torch? And so, and it's it's really important. So, um, yes. So we're we're even thinking, you know, parishes too. How can we get parish groups to start thinking about him and uh, and some of the the uh, values? But um, yeah, I think some of the I'll just and with this, uh, some of the criticisms I think of of Teilhard, um certainly at the time that he was writing and his inability to get books published and essays approved and things like that um, was that there was some, there was this notion of pantheism or of, um, you know, worshiping matter over humankind and, and, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the divide between spirit and matter. And even as he was entering the Jesuits, he struggled with that notion of, you know, it's either the earth or God. It's not, you can't do both, right? So mm -hmm. how uh, um, how much of that is still impacting Western thought, Catholic thought, American thought? What would you say to that? You pantheism or? You well, know, just, just, just this divide, this dualism that. Yeah, well, I think the dualism is there, right? Yeah. But I'm not sure. Uh, and, you know, for instance, yeah, I guess, yeah, the divide, if, if you think about God and and matter or, you know, like soul and body, I mean, like all that dualism, it's, it's very prominent, I think. And I think that's the thing that, you know, I was saying about the consciousness there, that's the kind of thing we have to get over. We can't, you know, the uh, we can't um, continue to think in that way. If we're really going to, uh, can, you know, uh, increase in consciousness, um, uh, but the interesting thing about pantheism. So pantheism means God and matter are the same, right? Yeah. Right. So right. A flower, God is in flower, and flowers in God, and that's all there is. Okay, but if, but the Catholic way, Christian probably way of thinking of it as panentheism, so mm -hmm. that yeah. uh, God is imminent, but also transcendent. Mm -hmm. But um, I wonder if for Teilhard, 
you know, if if it's even more, uh, you know, if it's not even necessary to think about it that way so much as, you know, the cosmic Christ is, um, you know, has been present in the, the cosmos, but has also gone ahead and is transcendent. And, you know, I so I think if, that would be the panentheistic way of thinking, but also maybe beyond that, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, last words from you, Sister Kathy, before we end mm -hmm. with a prayer. Well, it's been wonderful being with all of you. I wish I could see you and hear you and all of that. But um, but we do our best with these webinars. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I just want to encourage you to hope and to build. And build what you want, not what you are being told to build. Do you know what I mean? You really need to 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 reflect on what is important for yourselves, for your children, for the world. And um, and how can that come to be? And whatever you can do, if it means getting together with people or doing things, even if it's small, it really is important. And so I encourage you to do that. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, I appreciate being with you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been it's been wonderful. And, and for the Frosts, thank you for this amazing film. Um, mm -hmm. Again, if you haven't seen it, please, please go and watch it. It's it's just a it's a it's certainly a labor of love and um, mm, inspired. It, it really has inspired me and and I think all of us. Let's um let's end this with the 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 prayer that Pope Francis wrote at the end of Laudato Si because when you read it now in light of our discussion, you can see uh, Teilhard's uh, thinking creeping mm -hmm. into Laudato Si. So let's take a moment to quiet ourselves again and to be in God's presence and to thank God for this time for um, expanding our knowledge, for expanding our hearts. All-powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may, we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with, with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for uh, your attention. Amen. Thank you for spending an hour with us today. And uh, God bless you. We'll, we'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye now.